And while Ken is certainly renowned as the Adirondacks' most famous painter before he lived here at Asgard Farm, he lived for a number of years in an island community off the coast of Maine, where his work was among those recently celebrated in a commemorative exhibition. Our special contributor, Doug Cook, takes us to Monhegan Island in Maine this week to an artist colony where Kent's life and legacy are inextricably linked. An hour's ferry ride off the coast of Maine, about 12 miles, sits Monhegan Island. Long a haven for artists, it's a refuge of inspiration. The sun reflecting off the water, that rocky coastline, and on this day, the fog itself painting the island with a bit of mystery. A high point of any visit to the island is the Monhegan Museum of Art and History, a beacon shining a light on what has fascinated artists for generations. It recently celebrated its 50th anniversary with an exhibition that was a who's who of renowned artists who have captured Monhegan's natural beauty and mystique. The works that are hanging on the wall here have to do with some aspect of the island. So you can go there and see those buildings or those rocks. And if you pay close attention, you can actually get yourself to the very place where George Bellows was when he did that painting. Also featured works by Edward Hopper, Andrew Wyeth, and looming large among them, Rockwell Kent, the famed painter, printmaker, illustrator, and draftsman. Kent was certainly one of the great figures of uh, mid 20th century American art. Kent, who would spend two blocks of time on Monhegan, first arrived here in 1905, when he was 22. That first period, 1905 to 1910, was a major prolific period. Some of his greatest paintings were done in that period. Robert Stahl, associate director of the Monhegan Museum of Art and History, showed us around the house Kent built during this period. In 1906, he had hired someone in April to uh, build his house. Uh, April came and went, May came and went. Uh, by June, he lost patience, and he said out of anger was born a carpenter, and he did it himself. When Kent first got to the island, he did what he could to get by. He hauled lobster traps, he even dug graves, and it was here that Kent deepened his left-leaning socialist beliefs that would, decades later, land him in hot water with the government and with anti-communist crusader Joseph McCarthy. What makes Kent's work so powerful is is the fact that he became part of this community. He became part of the year-round community. There are a lot of artists who come to Monhegan and paint when it's you know pretty in the summer, in July and August. But Kent's work is, is a powerful connection to the island uh, and to the people of the island. And he reportedly had a powerful sense of self. He was a constant promoter. He sold stock in himself. He sold his, his name on the New York Stock Exchange eventually brought himself back so that he could feel as if he owned himself totally. But, you know, he was doing advertising, he was, he was doing illustrations, he was writing books, he was, he was constantly promoting the name Rockwell Kent. It was during Kent's second and final block of time on the island, which began in 1948, that the artist began to draw attention for more than the works of art he created. July 1953 would be an eventful time in his life. The beginning of the month brought an appearance before the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, chaired by Senator McCarthy. In Washington, Kent refused to answer whether he'd ever been a member of the Communist Party, and Kent was denied his request to read into the official Senate record a written statement he had prepared. Later, one newspaper did print it in its entirety. The very next week came the disappearance of Sally Moran, a New York socialite who once modeled for Kent. Kent and his wife had invited Moran to that island cottage he had built. During that stay, she left to take a walk and seemed to have disappeared. Three weeks later, fishermen found her body in the water 50 miles from shore. The headlines that surfaced suggested foul play. Rockwell Kent had been in New York at the time, and a grand jury ruled Sally Moran's death an accident. Robert Stahl says it was the sensationalism surrounding the episode that drove Kent never to return to Maine after that last visit to Monhegan in October 1953. Kent had created some of his greatest work here and offered much of it to a museum on the mainland, which wanted nothing to do with him. 
So blacklisted, Kent never exhibited in the U.S. again. And despite his nostalgic connections to Monhegan and to Maine, Kent would wind up giving much of his collection to the Soviet Union. As a consequence, though, Kent sold his house to fellow artist James Fitzgerald, and it's now owned by the Monhegan Museum. When faced with choosing just one Rockwell Kent piece for its anniversary exhibition, the museum landed on this, Village at Night. It tells something about how people lived here on the island at that time. Kent painted it in 1950, a few years before the McCarthy hearing and Sally Moran's disappearance. It perhaps foreshadows the darker time Kent himself would experience on the island, but is also an illuminating snapshot of Kent's enduring legacy. On Monhegan Island, Maine, Doug Cook for Mountain Lake Journal. The Monhegan Museum of Art and History is offering guided tours this summer of Rockwell Kent's cottage and studio on the island. The museum is open through the end of September.